and share my screen. All right, chapter 10, the endocrine system. So we usually study the endocrine system with the nervous system because it's communication, right? The nervous system is a way to get really fast communication from one part of your body to another. The endocrine system communicates from one end of your body to another, but much slower, right? But the signal that the endocrine system pr uh, produces, it persists for a longer amount of time. So it might take longer to get there, but it's going to persist for a long time. And most of the things in the endocrine system revolve around maintaining homeostasis, maintaining constant internal conditions, um, the level of glucose in your blood, the level of calcium in your blood, things like that. All right. So again, it's intracellular communication. It's communication between different cells. These are accomplished through chemical messages. And so again, that's why this is studied with the nervous system and the endocrine system. They both are communication systems. The endocrine system releases chemicals into the bloodstream. Okay, that's a really important aspect of the endocrine system. Its messages always get into the bloodstream and travel through the bloodstream to some other part of the body. Um, those messages are called hormones, right? So you have these different parts of the endocrine system that are called glands. They produce hormones and the hormones get into your bloodstream and travel throughout the body, wherever the bloodstream goes, which is everywhere, head to toe. But they only affect certain cells. So how does the endocrine system, how do those hormones know only to affect certain cells? Well, they're getting everywhere. They're going everywhere the blood travels so they can get anywhere in the body, but they will only affect the cells that have a specific receptor for that hormone. Um, those cells are called target cells, right? So all a target cell is, is a cell that has a receptor that's specific to the hormone that's coming out of your bloodstream. Um, so, you know, for example, your pituitary gland secretes a bunch of hormones into your bloodstream, right? And, and one of those hormones happens to be um, luteinizing hormone, which affects the ovaries and the testes. It gets everywhere, right? But it's not going to affect any cells of the kidneys or of the digestive system or anywhere else because they don't have the correct receptor. So only cells, only target cells have the correct receptor to receive that hormone. So again, they're still comparing the nervous and endocrine systems. They both use chemical messengers. Um, in the nerve, nervous system, they're called neurotransmitters. In the endocrine system, they're called hormones. So we think about <clears throat> the endocrine system. The cells themselves are glandular and they secrete things. And <clears throat> they secrete these chemical messengers that are released into the bloodstream. They're transported by the bloodstream to get to their target cells. And here is just an overview of a lot of the organs of the endocrine system that we'll talk about. We'll talk about the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid, the adrenal, the pancreas, the pineal gland, and the parathyroid glands. And then over kind of on the right side there in more of a, a gray color or tan color are organs that have secondary endocrine functions. So these are organs that do secrete hormones. They do have some endocrine function. That's not the major function of that, that organ. So the heart, for example, the heart secretes a hormone called ANP. But the heart, its major function is to beat to pump blood around the body, right? So it's not considered a primary endocrine organ. It's considered kind of a secondary endocrine organ. Basically, the hormones are grouped into two big categories. Now, I know here it says three. I'm going to show you why I, I would say it's really only two. Hormones can be made of either amino acids, right? So they can be proteins, or they can be made of lipids. Those are really the two big categories. Now, they get 
they get real picky here and they say that there's a difference between amino acids and peptide hormones, but they're, they're really just chains of amino acids, they're proteins. So these chemical messages that the glands are making, they're either made of protein or they're made of lipids. Those are the two big categories. And they act very differently. So here you can see up here on the, uh, on the upper left is an endocrine gland. It's releasing a hormone, which is this purple molecule into the bloodstream. This hormone goes everywhere that the bloodstream goes. So it's getting to skeletal muscles and it's getting to neurons. But this particular hormone is only affecting skeletal muscles because they have the correct receptor. These neurons don't have the correct shaped receptor, right? So the skeletal muscle is the target for this hormone. It's getting to other areas of the body. It's just not affecting those cells. wanted to go to this. So sorry for skipping ahead. I'm going to go back to this different groups of hormones. So the amino acid derivatives and the peptide hormones, those are all made of proteins, right? They're made of, and you can see even here, the peptide hormones are a chain of amino acids, right? So it's a protein. It's a long chain. Amino acid derivatives tend to be smaller, right? They're similar to single amino acids. Either way, those hormones are water soluble. Okay. These are called non-steroid hormones. They're water soluble. They actually can diffuse, they actually can't, sorry, diffuse across the membrane. If we think about a cell membrane, right? Cell membrane is made of lipids. And so things that are water soluble can't diffuse across it. So they actually have to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell, which triggers a change on the inside. The other types of hormones are lipid derivatives. These are called steroid hormones. Lipids can diffuse through that lipid bilayer. They can diffuse through the membrane. So they actually diffuse into the cell and into the nucleus in a lot of cases. And that's where they bind to their receptors inside the cell. Okay, so that's the big difference between protein hormones or non-steroid hormones and steroid hormones. Now, non-steroid hormones are water soluble. They can't get into the cell. They bind to a receptor on the outside and they trigger a change on the inside. Those act much quicker. Those are fast acting. Lipid derivatives, which are steroid hormones, they actually have to diffuse across the membrane and diffuse into the nucleus and bind to uh, a receptor in the nucleus and make new RNA and make new proteins, that happens a lot slower, right? Steroid hormones take longer to act. So what controls kind of the whole endocrine system is the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And the hypothalamus is part of your brain. It's below the thalamus, that's why it's called the hypothalamus. And it directly regulates the pituitary gland, <laughs> which regulates all your other glands of your uh, endocrine system. So I'm gonna actually go to a, a picture. So here is the brain. The hypothalamus is this part of the brain. It's kind of like a little triangle it's right here. Hanging down from the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. This is the pituitary gland. The, the stalk that it hangs by is called the infundibulum. The pituitary gland itself is divided into an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. Because the anterior lobe acts differently than the posterior lobe. <clears throat> the hypothalamus itself 
produces two hormones that travel through the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland and are released into the bloodstream and go to their target cells. Those are ADH and oxytocin. I'll talk about what they do in a few minutes. Okay, so they're made by the hypothalamus, secreted through the posterior pituitary, get into the bloodstream. Then there's a bunch of other hormones that the hypothalamus makes. They get into the bloodstream right here and they get out of the bloodstream right here. They're just traveling a few millimeters in the bloodstream. And those hormones are actually binding to receptors in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And it triggers the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland to secrete hormones. So it's a, it's a different type of control, right? The, the hypothalamus makes these two, two hormones that get secreted through the posterior lobe. It makes another five or six hormones that actually trigger the release of a secondary type of hormone from the anterior lobe of the pituitary. And then there's this third pathway, one special case um, that doesn't involve any, any hormone, well, it doesn't involve any of the hypothalamus or the pituitary. This is the release of the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine by the adrenal medulla. Okay, so your adrenal glands are down by your kidneys. They're sitting on top of your kidneys. And part of what they release is what we commonly call adrenaline. Right, you get a rush of adrenaline. That's that's epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is just triggered by the fight or flight mechanism. This is just kind of hardwired to your brain. And when your brain perceives a threat, it sends a signal, a direct signal, not a hormone. Right, it sends a direct signal through neurons to the adrenal medulla, causing the adrenal medulla to release these hormones. Right, so that's a third pathway that's completely different. So the first pathway, hypothalamus makes these hormones, they pass through the posterior pituitary to the body. Second pathway, hypothalamus makes some different hormones, which then bind to target cells in the anterior pituitary, causing the anterior pituitary to make another set of hormones, which go to different places in the body, right? So like A, then B, then C. And then the third pathway is this hardwired nervous system connection between the brain and the adrenal gland. Okay. The pituitary itself is called the hypothesis sometimes. It sits in a, in a bone, in a region of a bone called the cella ter tersica. Um, it secretes nine hormones and that's where we'll go to next. So again, here's your hypothalamus. Right? Hanging down from it is the infundibulum, that's the stalk. And there's your posterior lobe and your anterior lobe of your pituitary. Right? And it's sitting, this is a bone right here, it's called the sphenoid bone. If we look at the pituitary under a microscope when we're looking at the histology of it, the anterior lobe looks really different than the posterior lobe because they do different things. Right, the anterior lobe is making its own hormones and sending them out, whereas the posterior lobe is just kind of passing these or releasing these hormones through. There is something called the hypophysial portal system in the blood supply to the pituitary gland. All this is, is showing that there is there are blood vessels connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland so that the hypothalamus can make some hormones that get in the bloodstream and travel just a few millimeters to the pituitary gland. And that's where their target sites are in the anterior pituitary. That's all that this is showing. So the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, let's start with that one. Um, Again, this is where the hypophysial portal system comes in. This is showing that the hypothalamus secretes hormones that get into this little, these blood vessels that travel just a really small distance and they bind to receptors 
in the anterior pituitary and they trigger the anterior pituitary to actually uh, release hormones. Many of these hormones are called tropic hormones. And all that means, all tropic hormones are, it, it means that they are triggering the release of other hormones down the road, right? So sometimes the anterior pituitary is releasing a hormone that causes the thyroid to release another hormone. That's considered a tropic hormone. And these are the seven anterior lobe hormones. No, I think there's a better picture of this. I guess we'll go through this in words first. But here is a picture showing the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Here's the anterior lobe of the pituitary. These six hormones that are in purple, ACTH, TSH, GH, PRL, FSH, and LH. Those are the six released by the anterior pituitary. The seventh is released by this kind of intermediate area called MSH. The posterior pituitary doesn't actually produce any hormones. Those two hormones, ADH and ox oxytocin, OXT, are produced by the hypothalamus and just released through the, the posterior pituitary, okay? So as far as anterior pituitary hormones go, there are names of the hormones released by the hypothalamus that activate these hormones in purple. You don't have to know those for this class, right? What I want you to know are these six that are released by the anterior pituitary. Looks daunting at first, but they're not that bad. Okay, so let's go through them. The first one is called ACTH. Well, A stands for adreno, C stands for cortico. So it's adrenal corticotropic hormone, big word. But the word adreno is right in there, right? So you know it goes on to activate the adrenal gland. This is considered a tropic hormone. It's a tropic hormone because it activates another gland. <clears throat> Same thing with some of these that we'll see. They activate a second gland. And so that's called a tropic hormone. It doesn't have, so ACTH is not the, the end of this pathway, right? The end of this pathway is whatever's being released by the adrenal glands. ACTH, so when the anterior pituitary releases ACTH, it goes to target cells on the adrenal cortex, which is the outer thickness of the adrenal gland. And it stimulates the adrenal cortex to release glucocorticoids. So the end result is the release of these glucocorticoids, right? ACTH is just a way to get there. It's just the tropic hormone on how to get there. Glucocorticoids are things like cortisol, and so if you've ever uh, known somebody that's had a bad injury, right, they might sometimes get cortisone shots. Um, if you've had things like poison ivy, sometimes you put cortisone cream on there. It's an anti-inflammatory. There's also this little connection here. This was, this was number three on that previous slide. There's a direct connection between the brain and the adrenal medulla the inner part of the adrenal gland. And that direct connection causes the adrenal medulla to release norepinephrine and epinephrine. That's what we call adrenaline. So when your brain perceives a threat, right, it sends a signal to your adrenal medulla gland to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. It has nothing to do with ACTH, right? This pathway, ACTH, only leads to the release of glucocorticoids, whereas this pathway only leads to the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay. The anterior pituitary also releases TSH. That stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. That stimulates the thyroid gland. So this is a, trop a tropic hormone as well. It's just stimulating the thyroid gland. 
and it stimulates the thyroid to release T3 and T4. T3 and T4 are found, or um, help, you with the, help with metabolism or have a lot to do with your metabolism. So it's how well you break down what you eat and get energy from that. The anterior pituitary releases growth hormone. What do you think growth hormone does? In the name of it, what do you think it does? Just help you grow, like. Causes you to grow, right? This is something that's released in high levels when you're a child and even a teenager. Um, and the amount of growth hormone that we produce as we become adults becomes less and less because we don't need to keep growing. Um, so this actually goes to your liver and it helps to release um, chemicals that help your bone and muscles and other tissues grow. This is sometimes you hear about um, athletes taking steroids like football players taking steroids and they take human growth hormone, HGH, right? They take that to cause their muscles to grow. Now, side effects, it also causes your bones to grow and other tissues to grow. The reason they use, the reason a lot of athletes choose to use this instead of testosterone is that there are fewer tests for it. That's all that, they're, that's all that it is. It's harder to detect right now by the means that are available. Um, if you've ever seen like, um, you know, WWE wrestling, right? People like The Rock and, and people like that that wrestle. They look all huge right from the front and then they turn sideways and they kind of look bloated. Their stomach looks bloated. That's commonly called GH gut. And what happens when people are using a lot of GH, really high levels of GH, it causes their internal organs to grow. And eventually that's, you know, that can be a really bad thing that can lead to a lot of health, uh, health concerns. For most of us, Right, the, the amount of GH we secrete um, dramatically decreases as we get older, but some people continue to release GH throughout their entire lives. That's a disease called acromegaly. That's what Andre the Giant had. Andre the Giant kept growing. If you look at pictures of him when he was 20 and pictures of him when he was 40, he looked different. Um, his bones kept growing, his forehead grew. It was like wider, his jaw grew a lot. Um, eventually what killed him was his organs kept growing and his body couldn't keep up with those demands. Um, so that's, that's a, a disease or a disorder, I should say, called acromegaly. Um, the, there are people who have it who you can get like a surgery or a procedure done on your pituitary gland and, you know, kind of limit how much growth hormone you produce. Um, but Andre chose not to do that. That's eventually what killed him. So we've got ACTH, TSH, GH. The anterior pituitary also releases these two hormones. I know I'm skipping one, but I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. FSH and LH. They're linked together. They're always linked together. FSH and LH together stimulate either the testes or the ovaries. If they stimulate the ovaries, they cause the ovaries to produce estrogen and progesterone and insulin. If they stimulate the testes, they cause the testes to secrete testosterone and inhibit. So these FSH and LH are also tropic hormones along with ACTH and TSH. The one that I skipped over is called prolactin, P-R-L, prolactin. Prolactin is a hormone that causes the production of milk in mammary glands. Um, so when a woman is nursing, the more the child nurses, the more prolactin she makes and the more milk she should make. So all six of those are released by the anterior pituitary. There's this kind of intermediate zone that releases MSH, which is melanocyte stimulating hormone, which 
Um, nobody really knows the significance of what that does yet. Um, it obviously affects melanocytes, which cause skin pigmentation, but nobody exactly knows what's going on there. The two hormones that are directly, they're made by the, the hypothalamus and released through the posterior pituitary are ADH and oxytocin. ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. And if you know, like, what's a, what's a diuretic? What does a diuretic do? What do you mean, like? When you give somebody a diuretic, what, what happens? Like a milk or mag or something? Like something you help them go to the bathroom? Right. So a diuretic helps. It, it causes you to pee. It causes you to get rid of water, right? So if somebody's yeah. retaining oh, that, water, yeah. a lot of times you give them like basic. Um, yeah. So an antidiuretic, this is antidiuretic hormone. It's going to cause you to retain water. So oftentimes when you're, you know, dehydrated, water. this causes you to retain water. So oftentimes if you're dehydrated, your hypothalamus will secrete antidiuretic hormone to your kidneys you hold on to that water rather than passing it to your bladder. You hold on to it, retain water. It's anti-diuretic. Oh. Yeah, okay. The other hormone released by the posterior pituitary is oxytocin. Um, oxytocin in females causes uterine muscle contractions. So this is um, this is involved in childbirth, right? When when a woman's about to give birth to a child. She's producing high levels of oxytocin, which are causing the uterus to contract. Um, it's not really known, again, what the significance of this is in males. It does affect parts of the male reproductive system, the ductus deferens and the prostate gland. But why isn't exactly understood. Okay, but remember, these hormones, oops, these hormones are produced in males and females. It's just a matter, they only they will only have an effect on cells which have the correct receptor. Now, I got a message that we're gonna get kicked off in a minute. So I'm going to proactively end this and then sign right back on and try to finish this chapter, okay? So we'll sign right back on and we'll start up here. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs>